that our Saviour declares, that his great business into the world was, to testify and make good this great truth, that he was a king, 1. e. In other words, that he was the Messiah, that whoever were followers of truth, and got into the way of truth and happiness, received this doctrine concerning him, viz. that he was the Messiah, their king. Pilate being thus satisfied that he neither meant, nor could there arise, any harm from his pretense, whatever it was, to be a king, tells the Jews, verse 31, I find no fault in this man. But the Jews were the more fierce, Luke 23. 5. Saying, he stirreth up the people to sedition, by his preaching through all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. And then Pilate, learning that he was of Galilee, Herod's jurisdiction, sent him to Herod, to whom also the chief priests and scribes, verse 10, vehemently accused him. Herod, finding all their accusations either false or frivolous, thought our Saviour a bare object of contempt, and so turning him only into ridicule, sent him back to Pilate, who, calling unto him the chief priests, and the rulers, and the people, verse 14, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me, as one that perverteth the people, and behold, I having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching these things whereof ye accuse him, no, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done by him. And therefore he would have released him, for he knew the chief priests had delivered him through envy, Mark 15. 10. And when they demanded Barabbas to be released, but as for Jesus, cried, Crucify him, Luke 23. 22. Pilate said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him, I will, therefore, chastise him, and let him go. We may observe, in all this whole prosecution of the Jews, that they would fain have got it out of Jesus' his own mouth, in express words, that he was the Messiah, which not being able to do, with all their heart and endeavour, all the rest that they could allege against him not amounting to a proof before Pilate, that he claimed to be king of the Jews, or that he had caused, or done anything towards a mutiny or insurrection among the people, for upon these two, as we see, their whole charge turned, Pilate again and again pronounced him innocent, for so he did a fourth, and a fifth time, bringing him out to them, after he had whipped him, John 19, 4, 6. And after all, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water, and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man, see you to it. Matthew 27. 24. Which gives us a clear reason of the cautious and wary conduct of our Saviour, in not declaring himself, in the whole course of his ministry, so much as to his disciples, much less to the multitude, or, to the rulers of the Jews, in express words, to be the Messiah the King, and why he kept himself always in prophetical or parabolical terms he and his disciples preaching only the kingdom of God, 1. e. of the Messiah, to become, and left to his miracles to declare who he was, though this was the truth, which he came into the world, as he says himself, John 18. 37, to testify and which his disciples were to believe, when Pilate, satisfied of his innocence, would have released him, and the Jews persisted to cry out, Crucify him, crucify him, John 19. 6, Pilate says to them, Take ye him yourselves, and crucify him, for I do not find any fault in him. The Jews then, since they could not make him a state criminal, by alleging his saying, that he was the Son of God, say, by their law it was a capital crime, verse 7. The Jews answered to Pilate, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. 1. e. 
because, by saying he is the Son of God, he has made himself the Messiah, the Prophet, which was to come. For we find no other law but that against false prophets. Deuteronomy 18. 20, whereby making himself the Son of God, deserved death. After this, Pilate was the more desirous to release him. Verse 12, 13. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend, whosoever maketh himself a king, speaketh against Caesar. Here we see the stress of their charge against Jesus, whereby they hope to take away his life, viz. that he made himself king. We see also upon what they grounded this accusation, viz because he had owned himself to be the Son of God. For he hid in their hearing, never made or professed himself to be a king. We see here, likewise, the reason why they were so desirous to draw from his own mouth the confession in express words, that he was the Messiah, viz. that they might have what might be a clear proof that he did so. And, last of all, we see reason why, though in expressions which they understood, he owned himself to them to be the Messiah, yet he avoided declaring it to them in such words as might look criminal at Pilate's tribunal. He owned himself to be the Messiah plainly, to the understanding of the Jews, but in ways that could not, to the understanding of Pilate, make it appear that he had laid claim to the kingdom of Judea, or went about to make himself king of that country. But whether his saying that he was the Son of God, was criminal by their law, that Pilate troubled not himself about. He that considers what Tacitus, Suetonius, Seneca de Benef. 50. 3. 100. 26. Say of Tiberius and his reign, will find how necessary it was for our Saviour, if he would not die as a criminal and a traitor, to take great heed to his words and actions that he did or said not anything that might be offensive, or give the least tumbridge to the Roman government. It behoved an innocent man, who was taken notice of, for something extraordinary in him, to be very wary under a jealous and cruel prince, who encouraged informations, and filled his reign with executions for treason, under whom, words spoken innocently, or in jest, if they could be misconstrued, were made treason, and prosecuted with a rigour, that made it always the same thing to be accused and condemned. And therefore we see, that when the Jews told Pilate, John 19, 12, that he should not be a friend to Caesar, if he let Jesus go, for that whoever made himself king, was a rebel against Caesar, he asks them no more whether they would take Barabbas, and spare Jesus, but, though against his conscience, gives him up to death, to secure his own head. One thing more there is, that gives us light into this wise and necessarily cautious management of himself, which manifestly agrees with it and makes a part of it, and that is, the choice of his apostles, exactly suited to the design and foresight of the necessity of keeping the declaration of the kingdom of the Messiah, which was now expected, within certain general terms, during his ministry. It was not fit to open himself too plainly or forwardly to the heady Jews, that he himself was the Messiah, that was to be left to the observation of those who would attend to the purity of his life, the testimony of his miracles, and the conformity of all with the predictions concerning him, by these marks, those he lived amongst were to find it out without an express promulgation that he was the Messiah until after his death, his kingdom was to be opened to them by degrees, as well to prepare them to receive it, as to enable him to be long enough amongst them, to perform what was the work of the Messiah to be done, and fulfill all those several parts of what was foretold of him in the Old Testament, and we see applied to him in the New. The Jews had no other thoughts of their Messiah, but of a mighty temporal prince, that should raise their nation into an higher degree of power, dominion, and prosperity than ever it had enjoyed. They were filled with the expectation of a glorious earthly kingdom. It was not, therefore, for a poor man, the son of a carpenter, and, as they thought, 
born in Galilee, to pretend to it. None of the Jews, no, not his disciples, could have borne this, if he had expressly avowed this at first, and began his preaching and the opening of his kingdom this way, especially if he had added to it, that in a year or two, he should die an ignominious death upon the cross. They are therefore prepared for the truth by degrees. First, John the Baptist tells them, the kingdom of God, a name by which the Jews called the kingdom of the Messiah, is at hand. Then our Saviour comes, and he tells them of the kingdom of God, sometimes that it is at hand, and upon some occasions, that it is come, but says, in his public preaching, little or nothing of himself. Then come the apostles and evangelists after his death, and they, in express words, teach what his birth, life, and doctrine had done before, and had prepared the well, disposed to receive, viz. that Jesus is the Messiah. To this design and method of publishing the gospel, was the choice of the apostles exactly adjusted, a company of poor, ignorant, illiterate men, who, as Christ himself tells us, Matthew 11, 25, and Luke 10, 21, were not of the wise and prudent men of the world, they were, in that respect, but mere children. These, convinced by the miracles they saw him daily do, and the unblameable life he led, might be disposed to believe him to be the Messiah, and though they, with others, expected a temporal kingdom on earth, might yet rest satisfied in the truth of their master, who had honoured them with being near his person, that it would come, without being too inquisitive after the time, manner, or seat of his kingdom, as men of letters, more studied in their abins, or men of business, more versed in the world, would have been forward to have been, men, great or wise in knowledge, or ways of the world, would hardly have been kept from prying more narrowly into his design and conduct, or from questioning him about the ways and measures he would take, for ascending the throne, and what means were to be used towards it, and when they should in earnest set about it, abler men, of higher births or thoughts, would hardly have been hindered from whispering, at least to their friends and relations, that their master was the Messiah, and that, though he concealed himself to a fit opportunity, and until things were ripe for it, yet they should, ere long, see him break out of his obscurity, cast off the cloud, and declare himself, as he was, king of Israel. But the ignorance and lowness of these good, poor men, made them of another temper. They went along, in an implicit trust on him, punctually keeping to his commands, and not exceeding his commission. When he sent them to preach the gospel, he bid them preach the kingdom of God to be at hand, and that they did, without being more particular than he had ordered, or mixing their own prudence with his commands, to promote the kingdom of the Messiah. They preached it, without giving, or so much as intimating that their master was he, which men of another condition, and an higher education, would scarce have forborne to have done, when he asked them, who they thought him to be, and Peter answered, the Messiah, the Son of God, Matthew 16. 16, he plainly shows by the following words, that he himself had not told them so, and at the same time, verse 20, forbids them to tell this their opinion of him to anybody. How obedient they were to him in this, we may not only conclude from the silence of the evangelists concerning any such thing, published by their many, where before his death, but from the exact obedience three of them paid to a like command of his. He takes Peter, James, and John, into a mountain, and the Moses and Elias coming to him, he is transfigured before them, Matthew 17. 9. He charges them, saying, See that ye tell no man what ye have seen, until the Son of Man shall be risen from the dead. And Saint Luke tells us, what punctual observers they were of his orders in this case, chapter 9. 36. They kept it close, and told no man in those days, any of those things which they had seen. 
where the twelve other men, of quicker parts, and of a station or breeding, which might have given them any opinion of themselves, or their own abilities, would have been so easily kept from meddling, beyond just what was prescribed them, in a matter they had so much interest in, and have said nothing of what they might, in human prudence, have thought would have contributed to their master's reputation, and made way for his advancement to his kingdom, I leave to be considered, and it may suggest matter of meditation, whether Saint Paul was not for this reason, by his learning, parts, and warmer temper, better fitted for an apostle after, than during our Saviour's ministry, and therefore, though a chosen vessel, was not by the divine wisdom called, until after Christ's resurrection. I offer this only as a subject of magnifying the admirable contrivance of the divine wisdom, in the whole work of our redemption, as far as we are able to trace it, by the footsteps which God hath made visible to human reason. For though it be as easy to omnipotent power to do all things by an immediate over, ruling will, and so to make any instruments work, even contrary to their nature, in subserviency to his ends, yet his wisdom is not usually at the expense of miracles, if I may so say, but only in cases that require them, for the evidencing of some revelation or mission to be from him. He does constantly, unless where the confirmation of some truth requires it otherwise, bring about his purposes by means operating according to their natures. If it were not so, the course and evidence of things would be confounded, miracles would lose their name and force, and there could be no distinction between natural and supernatural. There had been no room left to see and admire the wisdom, as well as innocence of our Saviour, if he had rashly everywhere exposed himself to the fury of the Jews, and had always been preserved by a miraculous suspension of their malice or on miraculous rescuing him out of their hands. It was enough for him once to escape from the men of Nazareth, who were going to throw him down a precipice, for him never to preach to them again. Our Saviour had multitudes that followed him for the loaves, who barely seeing the miracles that he did, would have made him king, if to the miracles he did, he had openly added, in express words, that he was the Messiah, and the king they expected to deliver them, he would have had more followers, and warmer in the cause, and readier to set him up at the head of a tumult. These indeed God, by a miraculous influence, might have hindered from any such attempt, but then posterity could not have believed, that the nation of the Jews did, at that time, expect the Messiah, their king and deliverer, or that Jesus, who declared himself to be that king and deliverer, showed any miracles amongst them, to convince them of it, or did anything worthy to make him be credited or received. If he had gone about preaching to the multitude, which he drew after him, that he was the Messiah, the King of Israel, and this had been evidenced to Pilate, God could indeed, by a supernatural influence upon his mind, have made Pilate pronounce him innocent, and not condemn him as a malefactor, who had openly for three years together, preached sedition to the people, and endeavoured to persuade them, that he was the Messiah, their king, of the royal blood of David, come to deliver them. But then I ask, whether posterity would not either have suspected the story, or that some art had been used to gain that testimony from Pilate, because he could not, for nothing have been so favourable to Jesus, as to be willing to release so turbulent and seditious a man, to declare him innocent, and to cast the blame and guilt of his death, as unjust, upon the envy of the Jews. But now, the malice of the chief priests, scribes and Pharisees, the heaviness of the mob, animated with hopes, and raised with miracles, Judas's treachery, and Pilate's care of his government and of the peace of his province, all working naturally as they should, Jesus, by the admirable wariness of his carriage, and an extraordinary wisdom, visible in his whole conduct, weathers all these difficulties, does the work he comes for, uninterruptedly goes about preaching his full appointed time, 
sufficiently manifests himself to be the Messiah, in all the particulars the scriptures had foretold of him, and when his hour is come, suffers death, but is acknowledged, both by Judas that betrayed, and Pilate that condemned him, to die innocent. For, to use his own words, Luke 24, 46, thus it is written, and thus it behoved the Messiah to suffer. And of his whole conduct we have a reason and clear resolution in those words to Saint Peter, Matthew 26, 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scripture be fulfilled, that thus it must be? Having this clue to guide us, let us now observe, how our Saviour's preaching and conduct comported with it in the last scene of his life. How cautious he had been in the former part of his ministry we have already observed. We never find him to use the name of the Messiah but once, until he now came to Jerusalem, this last Passover. Before this, his preaching and miracles were less at Jerusalem, where he used to make but very short stays, than any, where else. But now he comes six days before the feast, and is every day in the temple teaching, and there publicly heals the blind and the lame, in the presence of the scribes, Pharisees, and chief priests, the time of his ministry drawing to an end, and his hour coming, he cared not how much the chief, priests, elders, rulers, and the Sanhedrim, were provoked against him by his doctrine and miracles, he was as open and bold in his preaching, and doing the works of the Messiah now at Jerusalem, and in the sight of the rulers, and of all the people, as he had been before cautious and reserved there, and careful to be little taken notice of in that place, and not to come in their way more than needs. All that he now took care of was, not what they should think of him, or design against him, for he knew they would seize him, but to say or do nothing that might be a just matter of accusation against him, or render him criminal to the governor. But, as for the grandees of the Jewish nation, he spares them not, but sharply now reprehends their miscarriages publicly in the temple, where he calls them more than once, hypocrites, as is to be seen, Matthew 23, and concludes all with no softer a compilation than serpents, and a generation of vipers. After this severe reproof of the scribes and Pharisees, being retired with his disciples into the Mount of Olives over against the temple, and the foretelling the destruction of it, his disciples ask him, Matthew 24, 3, and 100, when it should be, and what should be the sign of his coming? He says, to them, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, 1. e. taking on them the name and dignity of the Messiah, which is only mine, saying, I am the Messiah, and shall deceive many. But be not you by the misled, nor by persecution driven away from this fundamental truth, that I am the Messiah, for many shall be scandalized, and apostatize, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. 1. E. The good news of me, the Messiah, and my kingdom shall be spread through the world. This was the great and only point of belief they were warned to stick to, and this is inculcated again, verse 23 to 26, and Mark 13, 21 to 23, with this emphatical application to them, in both these evangelists, behold, I have told you beforehand, remember, you are forewarned. This was in answer to the apostles' inquiry, concerning his coming, and the end of the world, verse 3, for so we translate editor, illegible character, dot, we must understand the disciples here to put their question, according to the notion and way of speaking of the Jews, for they had two worlds, as we translate it, comma semicolon the present world, and the world to come, the kingdom of God, as they called it, or the time of the Messiah, they called comma the world to come, 
which they believed was to put an end to this world, and that then the just should be raised from the dead, to enjoy in that new world a happy eternity, with those of the Jewish nation, who should be then living. These two things, viz. the visible and powerful appearance of his kingdom, and the end of the world. Being confounded in the Apostle's question, our Saviour does not separate them, nor distinctly reply to them apart, but, leaving the inquirers in the common opinion, answers at once concerning his coming to take vengeance on the Jewish nation, and put an end to their church worship and commonwealth, which was their comma present world, which they counted should last till the Messiah came, and so it did and then had an end put to it, and to this he joins his last coming to judgment, in the glory of his Father, to put a final end to this world, and all the dispensation belonging to the posterity of Adam upon earth, this joining them together, made his answer obscure, and hard to be understood by them then, nor was it safe for him to speak plainer of his kingdom, and the destruction of Jerusalem unless he had a mind to be accused for having designs against the government, for Judas was amongst them, and whether no other but his apostles were comprehended under the name of his disciples, who were with him at this time, one cannot determine. Our Saviour, therefore, speaks of his kingdom in no other style, but that which he had all along hitherto used, viz. the kingdom of God, Luke 21. 31. When you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And continuing on his discourse with them, he has the same expression, Matthew, 25. 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be like unto ten virgins. At the end of the following parable of the talents, he adds, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on his left, then shall the king say, and one hundred. Here he describes to his disciples the appearance of his kingdom, wherein he will show himself a king in glory upon his throne, but this in such a way, and so remote, and so unintelligible to an heathen magistrate, that, if it had been alleged against him, it would have seemed rather the dream of a crazy brain, than the contrivance of an ambitious or dangerous man, designing against the government, the way of expressing what he meant, being in the prophetic style, which is seldom so plain as to be understood, till accomplished. It is plain, that his disciples themselves comprehended not what kingdom he here spoke of, from their question to him after his resurrection, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? Time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? Time restore.